Hi guys, welcome to this video looking at how you can investigate the reactivity of metals using acids, water and displacement reactions. So you need to be able to be given a metal and to be able to explain how you can work out how reactive it is compared to a different metal. If we start off with reactivity with acids then, whenever you put a metal into an acid you get a salt and hydrogen. You can prove this by using the squeaky pop test. If you put a lit splint in, you get a squeaky pop, that proves you've got hydrogen present. Now nice and simply, the more bubbles you get, the more reactive it is. So you'll be able to see that, there'll be more bubbles, more fizzing, and also if you put your lit splint in, you'll get a louder squeaky pop. So if I have a look at a few examples, if I put calcium, magnesium, iron and copper into hydrochloric acid, you can see here they're all reacting slightly differently. Calcium is producing a lot of bubbles, there is a lot of fizzing going on, therefore there is a lot of hydrogen gas being produced. It is very reactive. If I look at magnesium, it is still very reactive because I've got lots of bubbles being given off, there's lots of fizzing, lots of effervescence, lots of hydrogen being given off. However, it is less reactive than calcium because there are less bubbles. If we look at iron, you can see that it's unreactive. It's still reacting because there are a few bubbles on the surface, but compared to the other two, it is very unreactive. And then finally, if we look at copper, we say that it's completely unreactive, it does not react, there are no bubbles on the surface and it is the least reactive of the four. If I move on to the reactivity with water then, so if I take cold water and add it to a metal, if it's reactive enough I will get a metal hydroxide and I will get hydrogen gas again. Again you can prove that with your squeaky pop test. Now the difference here is it will only work with the more reactive metals like potassium, calcium and sodium. If I take an unreactive metal not much will happen. So for example if you use magnesium not much will be seen, there won't be many bubbles. There will be no reaction at all. So for example if I look and show you the reaction between calcium and magnesium and water you can see here that calcium when I put it into cold water is bubbling, it's fizzing so that is one of the more reactive metals. Magnesium, which if you remember in the previous one with acids produced loads of bubbles, it's not doing anything now so we can say that magnesium is definitely less reactive than calcium. Now, staying on the idea of water, if we heat that water up and turn it into steam, H2O as a gas, you'll get something slightly different. This time you get an oxide, not a hydroxide. So for example, magnesium will give you magnesium oxide. You still get your hydrogen gas, but it will now react and your less reactive metals will react. So for example, magnesium. Now you can prove this by getting yourself a boiling tube, having some metal in there and then heating up some mineral wool with water. You'll get hydrogen gas produced, use your lit splint and you get your squeaky pop. Copper however does not react at all. Here is that apparatus that I just talked about, so you can see here I've got my mineral wool in the end, it's starting to evaporate the water, turning that water into gas whilst I'm heating it. That gas is then reacting with my magnesium metal and it's starting to turn into magnesium oxide and then you can see a gas coming out at the end and if I put a lit splint up to that gas I should get a squeaky pop. As you can see there. Okay, the last one then is displacement reactions. Now nice and simply, if a metal is more reactive it will swap places or displace the less reactive metal in a compound. So, for example, if I have copper sulfate and add iron to it, iron is more reactive and it will swap places with it and it will now be part of the compound. If I have something that's less reactive though, like silver, it won't react. So if I add silver and copper nitrate together, there'll be no reaction because the more reactive one is already part of the compound. And I can prove that with this time-lapse video. In here I've got copper sulfate and I've got an iron nail. You can see the colour of the iron nail changing. This is because the copper is reacting and swapping places with the iron, iron being the more reactive one. So you can see copper starting to coat onto the nail and iron sulfate being left in the solution, which is why the solution is changing colour. If I leave this going long enough, you'll be able to see the actual colour of the nail. And I've got a picture at the end of this video actually showing you the copper coating the nail. And you should be able to see that here. Right, that's the discover part of the lesson over. Let's have a look at the apply, so having a few example questions. So there are four that I'd like you to have a go at. The first one being, describe how you could investigate how reactive lithium, magnesium and lead are. I would recommend going with the acid one here, 
because you know that you will see specific differences between the three. Using water, you may not see the difference between magnesium and lead, for example. So talk it through, what you would you see and how would you know which is the most reactive? Question two, write the word equations for the reactions between lithium and hydrochloric acid, sodium and cold water, beryllium and steam, remembering that steam, when you put it into a word equation, will just be water, and then lead and copper sulfate. Question three is to write the balanced equations for those. A little bit trickier, hopefully you should be quite confident in doing those by now. If not, go back to the balancing equations videos and have a look at them. I'll put some links on the right hand side of this video. And then finally, number four, explain how you could work out the reactivity of copper, iron and lead when given a sample of each metal and their respective sulfates. So this one's looking at the displacement reactions, how would you do it step by step. Pause the video, have a go at each question and we'll see how you've done in a minute. Okay, let's start to go through then. So as I said, the first one, I'd recommend using the acids. So first things first, your first marking point is to add the metals to hydrochloric acid. Then it's what would you see? The most bubbles, fizzing or effervescence will be the most reactive or some sort of explanation along that lines. You could have said the actual one, so lithium would probably give you more bubbles than magnesium, which would give you more bubbles than lead. On to question two, the word equations. So you're reacting lithium and hydrochloric acid together. Remember I said that you get the salt. The salt is always going to be a chloride because you've got hydrochloric acid. So you're gonna get lithium chloride and you should remember the gas that we get is hydrogen. Sodium and cold water. So sodium and cold water gave you a hydroxide. So we're gonna have sodium hydroxide and again, hydrogen. And then beryllium with steam. Hopefully you remember that steam gave an oxide, not a hydroxide. So I'll get beryllium oxide and hydrogen again. Part D is the displacement reaction. So lead and copper sulfate. Lead is more reactive than copper, therefore I will get lead sulfate and copper. On to question three, this is the balanced equations. So this is a little bit tougher now. Lithium is in group one. Your chloride is in group seven. Therefore, the charge is balanced, so lithium chloride is going to be LiCl. You should remember hydrochloric acid is HCl, and you should remember that hydrogen is H2. So you should have something looking like that for your first mark. Your second mark is for balancing. So I've got two hydrogens on the right, therefore I need two on the left, so I can put a two in front of HCl. I have, therefore, two chlorines on the left, and only one on the right, so I'll put a two in front of the LiCl. And then finally, I've now got two lithiums on the right, but not on the left, so I put a two there. Sodium and cold water. Sodium you should know is Na, water H2O. Sodium hydroxide, you should remember a hydroxide ion is OH minus. Sodium is in group one, so Na plus. Therefore, I'm gonna have Na plus H2O goes to NaOH plus H2. In terms of balancing, I've now got three hydrogens on the right, so let's even that out by putting a two in front of NaOH. And now I've got four hydrogens, so I need to double my water to give me four hydrogens. I've got two oxygens on both sides. All I'm left with is my sodium. I've got two on the right now, so I need two on the left. So one mark for the equation, one mark for the balancing. Brillium and steam, so brillium oxide. Brillium is in group two, so Be2 plus. Oxygen is in group six, O2 minus. Therefore, the charges cancel each other out. So you'll get Be plus H2O goes to BeO plus H2. You get one mark for the left-hand side and one mark for the right-hand side on this one. And then finally, lead is 2 plus and copper is 2 plus. The ones that you come across will always be that case, so you should be able to then work out the formula, provided you know that sulfate is SO4 2 minus. So, lead is Pb, copper sulfate Cu2 plus SO4 2 minus, so it's just Cu SO4, and because all of them are 2 plus and 2 minus, it's the same all the way across. So we're going to have Pb plus CuSO4 goes to PbSO4 plus Cu. One mark for the left-hand side and one mark for the right. Finally then, if we go on to question four, so how could you work out the reactivity of copper, iron and lead when given a sample of each metal and their respected sulfates? So that's, for example, copper sulfate, iron sulfate and lead sulfate. So what you do, let's start off with copper, for example. I'll put that into iron sulfate and lead sulfate. I'll then see what happens. If it displaces them, it's going to be more reactive. And you'll see a colour change. You want to do this with all three metals, so add iron to copper sulphate and lead sulphate, and then lead to copper sulphate and iron sulphate. 
and then the metal that displaces both of the others is the most reactive the metal that doesn't displace any of them is the least reactive and that's how you can work it out so there are six ways of getting your four marks there give yourself a mark out of four that's pretty much this video at an end. There is a review question which says explain how you could prove the reactivity of the following metals and in your answer you should include more than one method of proving how reactive they are as well as your expected observations. Hi guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please click on like down below. You can also subscribe to get more updates. You can visit the website for more information and you can look at my latest video. Thanks for watching.